Uh, you might remember the last time we've reached uh, the point in our, our study of Matthew where we're looking at the passion narrative and then the question, uh, and a lot of questions present themselves that a lot of people when reading the passion narrative or hearing it spoken, uh, never really think about. Uh, but one, one that Spong brings up is, uh, you know, who were the, eye if this is a historical narrative, right, who were the eyewitness, uh, you know, reporters that uh, were writing down each of these events, uh, especially when it says very clearly that, you know, after the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was utterly abandoned by all of his apostles, Peter, wow. James, John, uh, uh, the, the whole crew, you know, Jesus was utterly alone. Uh, well, then where are the stories of Jesus discussing, uh, oh, well, if, if you look at John, uh, discussing f the philosophy of truth with Pilate, where, where are the stories, uh, you know, that, that ensue after uh, the, the arrest in the garden? Where, who are the eyewitnesses, you know, claiming those stories? Even at the crucifixion, the women are rather late on the scene. Um, so, so who is the omniscient narrator? narrator here. So the last time we basically looked at the various scenes that uh, comprise the passion narrative going with, you know, starting with the Passover meal, then the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus betrayed, and then Jesus going before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, and then later being taken. And then, of course, Matthew has this place spot in his narrative where uh, he tells the story of Judas repenting and throwing the 30 silver, uh, pieces of silver, which is not in uh, the other gospels, but the story of Jesus before Pilate, the Barabbas, the scourging, and finally the crucifixion uh, and the events that happened at the crucifixion. We, we ended last time talking about this uh, oh, in, uh, in some historical well actually i won't call it that but there's something known as a hapax legomenon it's only mentioned in one place right and the very brief reference <clears throat> at jesus crucifixion to when you know at at the death of jesus uh, and the temple veil is 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 shorn in two and then it says interestingly that the graves of the ancestors are opened and they are walking through Jerusalem, you know, and there are many people who witness this. Um, you know, it, you can understand why that was probably left out of uh, the later gospels, but it is, you know, a, a story that, uh, that is included in Matthew. Um, and then of course the women showing up the cross and the soldiers guarding the tomb and then the resurrection itself. Uh, this is, you know, I, I noted here that they, this, there are a number of scenes, you might call them, you know, uh, in this narrative that we go through. And uh, Spong is going to pick up on this, and he's going to refer to them not so much as, as scenes, but as watches. Uh, so I'll have you, um, I'll have you remember just what it was that um, we were talking about back in chapter 12, because we're going to, you know, have to resurrect that, no pun intended, uh, from our, um, our memory, uh, because Spong is going to make another argument uh, that is going to uh, pertain to an extended liturgy known as a vigil uh, as we uh, move into this. But here is his, um, you know, after discussing the narrative as we did, here are Spong's questions about the, uh, the passion narrative. And I thought it was important enough. It, it provides a nice transition. You know, when we teach students to write, we always want them to have transition statements, you know, between their, um, you, know, you know, between the, um, uh, I, I guess, points that they want to make. And, uh, you, you know, so that, that your readers can have a good sense of, you know, now I'm I'm moving on to another thesis that I wanted to develop or something. Well, Spong does this very well. Uh, he um, he has uh, this transition sentence. You might say, "How are we to read this narrative in Matthew? 
Was it the product of eyewitness reporting? If so, who were the eyewitnesses? Are these episodes meant to describe events that really happened? Or is there some other way that the readers of these gospels were meant to view this narrative? Would the Jewish followers of Jesus, who would have been the first to read these words about the crucifixion, would they have understood it differently? Have the details of this narrative been shaped by the Hebrew scriptures? And that is the key line right there. Have the details of this narrative been shaped by the Hebrew scriptures? As we have seen the details of the narrative throughout Matthew been shaped by uh, the details, uh, excuse me, been shaped by the Hebrew scriptures themselves. Jesus being uh, uh, seen as a new Moses, Jesus being placed in a, a context of, of, of Elijah and Moses, for example. There's so much of the Hebrew scriptures that just uh, shines through in this Matthew, uh, this narrative. Have, have the details of the narrative been formulated by liturgical considerations? These are the questions to which we now turn. And there's that beautiful you know, transition sentence. And of course, it's a rhetorical question. And we all know by now <laughs> that yes, they have been, uh, this narrative has been formulated uh, by uh, liturgical considerations. So before we move into that, let me um, let me stop and see if there are any uh, questions or con uh, comments. I tried to do a, a quick overview for people who weren't here, you know, last time or maybe a couple times before. Um, so I want to make sure we're all on the same page because this is really, I mean, the the denouement. This is the conclusion of what uh, Spong wants to argue. Uh, Spong thinking about the way that this narrative has been informed by the Hebrew scriptures, he says, you know, let's go at this the way that investigators go at their, you know, they live their crime scenes, or really more specific, the way that biblical scholars read a text with all the historical critical tools uh, at their disposal. And what they're doing is they're probing the narrative for interpretive clues. What kind of clues do we have? What words do we see that are used that might point us in a direction of how to interpret? What, um, or specifically, what lines uh, that are used that ring in our ears as, boy, I, I think I've heard that someplace before. Uh, and Spong wants to look at some of the so-called intimate details of, of Matthew's passion narrative. Uh, Jesus, for example, uh, you can't get any more intimate than Jesus speaking the last words from the cross. And if the women show up at the, the, you know, the final hour, perhaps they could have been the eyewitnesses. But uh, Spong is saying, you know, let's get away from this idea that we're, we're looking at this historical account. No, Jesus' last words from the cross are specifically chosen by the author of Matthew to ring in the ears of the Jewish followers of Jesus. I can't really call them Christians, so per se, um, for reasons I won't go into, but the Jewish followers of Jesus, what are they hearing? When, they hearing, when they're hearing some of these clues. Um, Spong reminds us, we don't have a good source. Matthew writing is quite distant from the source. If Jesus died, let's just put it at 30 of the Common Era, and Matthew is, is writing in 85 of the Common Era. What, what are his, his sources here, right? And they're certainly uh, separated by at least 50 years of, um, you know, of time. Then not only that, and this is something we don't quite often think about, but Jesus was an Aramaic-speaking Jew. Uh, when he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he wasn't teaching it in the language that we read it when we read it in the so-called primary sources, right? Jesus most likely did not speak Greek. 
Now, when I, I tell my students this, they, they always say, well, Jesus was God. He could speak Swahili if he wanted to. Well, no, <laughs> let's get back to the historical critical method here. Jesus as a human being in a particular historical context, context was a product of that context. And if we know the context, we can know something of uh, the paradigm and the thought process of people living in that context. Jesus spoke Aramaic. This story is about Jesus would later be translated into Greek, uh, which was the lingua franca of uh, the, the time in which uh, the Romans were uh, in control of, of Judea and all of Palestine. So we have that uh, issue to, to, um, to get around. But And then the point that I've already made here is that even the text itself lends itself to us asking questions about, hey, well, you know, if we know, as the text says, that Jesus died utterly alone, then where is the source of the story? Who is telling this tale? Who is the omniscient narrator? Now, Spong later, Spong after this in, in chapter 30, goes into some other detail that you might find uh, rather surprising. Because, you know, when we read scripture, what we tend to do is we read it organically, you know, uh, so that things that we we read in Paul uh, can be supplemented by what we read in, in um, Matthew, for example. So when Paul talks about the Last Supper, we can assume that Paul is saying, well, you know, Jesus broke the bread and poured the wine, and, uh, and after that he, he was, you, you know, we can assume the details that we don't find in Paul. The best example of this, of, of reading scripture organically, I think, is um, the one that actually you all might remember several years ago in um, a class, and I can't even remember what class it was. I think it was on the apocalyptic literature. When I made the comment that, you know, when we read Genesis and we read about the serpent, you know, tempting Eve and tempting Adam, um, that's not Satan, you know? It doesn't say in the, in the text that that is Satan doing that, you know? Uh, it just says it's the serpent, the wiliest of, of God's creatures. But of course, there was uh, one woman there, I can't remember her name, probably best that I don't, uh, but afterwards, they didn't come to the Bible study anymore because they thought I was suggesting that you know, that Satan didn't tempt Adam and Eve in the garden. I'm just saying, no, contextually, when this was written, there was no conception of Satan. When we read all of scripture organically, we get a sense later on, and especially if we add theology to it, that that serpent was Satan. But when the text was written, Satan wasn't an idea that we could attribute to the, the serpent itself. So we have to take that same lens and look at Paul. Um, and if we wanna get historical about all this, naturally historians go to the, the earliest sources that we have, and they are often seen as the most reliable. So if we wanna know the most reliable um, means of knowing what went on, it makes sense to start with Paul who was writing between 48 and 60 of the Common Era. Uh, it would be later that Matthew would be writing some, you know, in some cases uh, about 35 years later. What does Paul say about the events of the Passion? Is there any reference to the Passion narrative in Paul that, that seems to match up with what we've already read? And really, not so much. And, I, and I'd i like to read this because uh, Spong does such a great job of explaining this in such a few short sentences, uh, but it makes so much sense uh, in a way, and I don't want to be messing it up for you. But um, I'm going to start in the middle of page 322, and I'm going to skip some lines here and there. It's of interest to note 
that Paul, the earliest writer of the material that in time came to be included in the New Testament, Paul describes this crucifixion, the crucifixion in one sentence. All right, let's, let's get our head around that. Paul describes the crucifixion, the passion narrative in one sentence. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. These words were written about the year 54 of the Common Era and some 18 years before Mark's gospel appeared. Paul gives us no narrative details, no Judas, no garden, no Pilate, no Barabbas, no thieves, no words from the cross. Was that because he did not know these details or was that because these details had not yet been written? It could be one of those two things. Maybe Paul didn't know those details. But Spong is going to suggest, no, those details hadn't been written yet. We had to wait till Mark and Matthew come along to, to, to read uh, those details. Um, of the burial of Jesus, Paul writes only, he was buried. <laughs> Pretty slim, right? 1 Corinthians 15.4. There's no narrative of Joseph of Arimathea or of a tomb in a garden. Was that because the burial tradition involving Joseph had not yet been developed? And of course, Spong wants us to answer, oh yeah, I see where you're going with this. Yes, it hadn't been developed yet. When Paul comes to describe the Easter experience, the central experience of, of the Gospels, right? This is the reason why the Gospels are written, the resurrection. Now note, Note what Spong points out here that is not often recognized, but it's very, it's a very uh, cutting, I should say, uh, insight. When Paul comes to describe the Easter experience, he's again sparse in detail. And here it is, the quote from 1 Corinthians, on the third day he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. Paul gives no narrative details. But he does provide a list of those to whom Jesus, quote unquote, appeared. Okay. Remember, Jesus appeared to Paul in what was kind of a visionary experience, right? Um, the list is intriguing. Cephas, that is Peter, is first, then the 12, followed by 500 brethren at once. And then he, Paul, continues with what seems to be a parallel list. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And finally, Paul says, he appeared to me. There are several things to note here. First, the phrase, the 12. That seems to suggest that the 12 disciples are still intact as a group. So according to, to Paul, Judas is still a part of that group. Jesus appears on the third day, you know, in accordance with the scriptures, to the 12 apostles. Uh, I, I should say simply the 12. And although Paul says that this appearance was on the third day after the crucifixion, he seems to be implying that Judas was still among them. Second, the 12, and then later, the apostles appear to be two different groups. Paul has two parallel lists. He appears to Peter, the 12, and the 500 brethren. Then he appears to James, and then to the apostles, and then uh, later on to Paul. Um, appear to be two different groups. Who are the 12 and who are the apostles? Uh, third, Paul is claiming that the appearance of the raised Jesus to him, Paul, was no different from the appearances to any of the others on the, his list except that his was last. And that was seen as a visionary experience. It was a visionary experience, not a bodily encounter with Jesus. So all the way down the bottom of the paragraph. So while Paul is not himself an eyewitness to the narrative of the passion story, he is the first to give us anything in writing. And what he writes includes no references to the narrative that first appear in the gospel of Mark. Um, this doesn't preach well, of course, right? But we're not being preachers here. We're being biblical scholars. And Spong has unearthed something that, you know, really needs to be explained. How do you explain 
this? Why, you know, well, the easy answer is, well, Paul didn't know about all this. Uh, well, but, you know, he had a lot of conversations with, remember, he met in the Jerusalem Council with Peter, James, and John, and, uh, you know, had conversations with the apostles. He was raising money for the Jerusalem, you know, church. Uh, he obviously had communication with these guys. There's, it doesn't seem conceivable that Paul could not have known about this. The more logical argument, says Spong, is that while Paul was writing this narrative that we know so well, that we read at during Holy Week, and we presume is some sort of historical account of the life of Jesus, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, hasn't, hasn't been written. Why? Well, because Bong is saying that it is going to be uh, more is more conceivable. Uh, Denny is joining us now. More conceivable that this whole story that we've just gone through is going to be important as a liturgical um, as a liturgical uh, a document, as something that will be liturgically used in the synagogue. And he's going to back this story up with a lot of really good detail that is hard to argue against. So um, he, here's Spong's argument for liturgy beginning in uh, about two or three pages into chapter 30. So let me stop there and see if there's anything that I can clarify. Um, Welcome to Denny, who's just joined us. There you are. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Good to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> good to be seen, not viewed, as they say, right? Yeah. Well, good. Uh, any questions or comments? I guess I'd have a quick comment, Dan, on um, your discussion about people understanding the Bible organically. Yeah. And it would be my experience, I guess, that when you're talking about that uh, writing in Paul that says that he was raised in accordance with the scriptures and that, you know, such and such happened in according with the scriptures, a lot of readers say, well, yeah, the scriptures, yeah. Mark, Matthew. Oh. I mean, I think that's a common interpretation. Right, right. Um, yeah, I've I've heard that before. Um, David McCarthy talks about praying with people, you know, in in the hospice situations or you know in in the hospital, and oftentimes we'll we'll read a psalm. And one time, I think this was David who was telling me this. One time, the uh, the people objected and said, "Hey, no, we're we're New Testament Christians." <laughs> Oh, wow, I didn't realize that you only read a third of the book that you uh, count as sacred scripture. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, this is why that teaching that uh, old Hebrew Bible class at Hastings College, uh, when I came in 2001, they wanted me to, to, to teach both of those classes together. And I said, absolutely not. I can't even imagine trying to get through the entire Bible uh, you know, uh, and, and of course, focus primarily on the New Testament. I can't imagine trying to get through the entire Bible in a single semester. You know, two thirds of it needs to be known. And especially what I call the flyover texts, you know, uh, the flyover texts of the prophets and those that are, aren't commonly read. If you don't know those, then when you're reading this text that we're talking about right here, if you don't know Isaiah, for example, then you're not going to get what Spong is talking about. And I want to try to illuminate that a little bit here for, for those who might, you know, be a little bit, um, uh, need a little refresher on their Old Testament uh, understanding. But it is uh, rather lamentable, isn't it, uh, Mac, <laughs> that the scriptures in this case are often seen by people as just the New Testament or even just the Gospels alone um, and the red letter Gospels at that, right? <laughs> Which creates all kinds of problems. But any other comments about this? 
Will, it looks like you have your, oh no, I guess not, everyone. Any comments, questions? Good group here today. Number wise, go ahead, Will. You're muted, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, how did David handle that? Did he tell you that? No, but I'm sure he would have done so with, with grace, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not, that of course is not the time when, you know, a, a child is suffering or, or, you know, it's, it's not the time to wax scholarly. Um, my guess is, I don't know if you would do this differently, but my guess is I would just be compliant and, you know, move to some sort of New Testament text and just leave it for another day. Um, but it's not uncommon. I don't think Andy is still with us. Uh, he had to, Oh yeah, you're in. I'm yeah. still here. Andy, how do you deal with that? I mean, in a hospice situation, have you ever had, what if somebody said, uh, hey, we're New Testament Christians, don't read from that Hebrew Bible? Oh, then I would have, you know, as a, as a chaplain, I, I don't, I don't necessarily care where they get their spiritual comfort from. Yeah. So we'll move into the, to the gospels or some other. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I think the, the point we're trying to, to illuminate here is that, you know, we, uh, and it's unfortunate, we don't read the New Testament through the lens of the Old Testament. In fact, we do it just as my grandmother used to say, bass awkward. <laughs> if you're familiar with that Appalachian reference, uh, we read the New Testament, we read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Uh, so when we read in Isaiah, well, this is, you know, this is predicting the coming of Jesus or, you know, uh, but we have to read the New Testament through the lens of the Old Testament. And this is what Spong is doing when he's trying to find clues in the narrative that we've been talking about that seem to resonate or seem to put us in mind of uh images or metaphors or even direct references that we know were so important to the Jewish people who were writing the passion narrative. And let's just call him Matthew for now. Uh, but we know that this was uh, a narrative that rose up out of the synagogue community of, of, of Jewish followers of Jesus. Well, Spawn goes to um, probably the most intimate aspect of the narrative itself. And these are Jesus' last words from the cross. Now, you know, it's, I don't want to get into the physiology of, of, the, of the crucifixion, but when you're dying on the cross, uh, you're basically suffocating and um, don't really have the capacity to, to say much of anything, right? And they, so that's just the, you know, physiologically an issue. And the second one we've already raised, who, who was there listening? What reliable source was there listening to Jesus? Another issue is why did the three or the four gospels altogether have Jesus saying different things at different times, right? Jesus was a re regular, if you pardon the irreverence here, but a regular chatty guy on the cross. If you read all of the gospels, and write, read all those passion narratives. So that's the place Spong says, you know, is it likely that someone dying on the cross would have been speaking that way? Prob probably not. Um, would there have been people close enough to hear him who would be reliable witnesses? Probably not. So these words from the cross were probably meant to be very important to the author who is writing the passion narrative. And in Matthew, what does Jesus say from the cross? And this is a place where I should have opened my book of Psalms first. He does say something that would have been known quite well by the Jewish followers of- My of God, Jesus my there. God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, right, right. Uh, if you read Psalm 22, the very first line of the psalm is my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far from helping me from from the words of my groaning 
Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, but find no rest. So this is, you know, the a lament. And we're going to find that this lament is going to have other parallels. If you read all of Psalm 22, which is a rather long psalm, it's going to have other parallels in the passion scene, in the crucifixion scene itself. But let's let's just back up a little bit here. Okay, and let's leave our context of uh, Jesus dying on the cross, which would have happened around 30 of the Common Era, and then Matthew writing about it in 85 of the Common Era. And let's back up, let's roll all the way through history um, to a time period uh, known as the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, roughly between 597 BCE and 539 uh, before the Common Era. And let's think about uh, a prophet that we often read piecemeal, right? We often just pull a, a phrase here and there. But think about the, the context in which the Jews uh, are trying to worship God and trying to understand what has happened to them. The Jews have been, and, and it's in Babylon where they're first called Jews, the people of Judah, they have been taken captive by the Babylonians who basically over a 10 year period of time moved into Jerusalem, 597 to 587, first took away all of the, you know, uh, the kings and the, the people and, and the priests and people who had, you know, high positions of leadership and authority. And then gradually, you know, started moving people out of Jerusalem and of course, placing different people in Jerusalem that were not, you know, uh, Jewish uh, of the Jewish uh, uh, religion. Uh, the temple was destroyed. The Babylonians destroyed that first off, right? And so imagine yourself in Babylon. You are utterly a refugee. You um, and you have been, uh, I don't want to say fed, you have been raised on the sense that God has chosen you for a special destiny. Your community of, of followers of the covenant, those who see themselves as chosen by God to be a covenant people, wow, where is that now? A, God's temple has been destroyed. B, uh, the priesthood is gone. You can't even worship in the same way that you used to. Uh, C, your ability you know, to worship in, in a way that is uh, in any way connected with the temple is gone. You are completely out of luck, really. And this is the way the Babylonians wanted. They wanted to, de to destroy the culture, right? It's this way you assimilate people into your culture. You destroy their old culture. But the, the Jews, as they were being called at that time, did not want that to happen. They did not allow that to happen. And it was going to be one of the... Um, the priests who were, you know, taken from Jerusalem into uh, Babylon, who was going to provide a new image of hope for um, uh, the Jews that were being held captive there. And his name was, was Isaiah. And as you all know, uh, Isaiah is a prophet, one of the, the major prophets, uh, but he wasn't a single person. He was more like a, um, uh, a tradition. The first Isaiah who wrote chapters one through 39 was writing somewhere around 700 of the common era, or uh, excuse me, before the common era, 700 before the common era. The second Isaiah who wrote chapters 40 through 55 was writing during the Babylonian captivity. And it's this Isaiah who is going to give hope to the people. He is going to, in the tradition of his predecessor, uh, interpret events through the lens of what it means to be a covenant people still loved and cherished by God. And guess what, he says? You're gonna have to give up all your old imagery. We're just gonna have to put on a new pair of goggles 
a new pair of lenses through which we interpret our experience and imagine not that God has been destroyed by Marduk, you know, the, uh, the Babylonian God, but that God is still in control, not just of our, you know, our tribal community, but of the entire universe, right? It's in Babylon that they start thinking of God as the creator of all. And God still is loving this and, and has a, a purpose for this chosen people who are now suffering, who are now completely displaced from the world. And it's in this context that the whole uh, notion of the suffering servant comes into play. Now, it's hard to read this text and not think of Jesus, right? Because we, we every Easter of our lives, we've always, you know, heard this as a text that was, uh, that was predicting the coming of Jesus. And actually, that's kind of turned around. We need to think of it in a way that, that's turned around. What the text, when it was written, is referring to is the people of Babylon who are suffering and doubting the fact that they had anything to do with the will of God as God's covenant people anymore. And Isaiah wants to say, no, that's not true. God is going to be doing something that's paradoxical here. It is not through the power of David or through the power of our kings or the power of our military that, that God's will for the world is going to come to fruition. That's an old way of thinking. And you, this is Isaiah still speaking. And you who are held captive in, Jude, in, in, in Babylon, you need to get that out of your mind because there's a new way of being in the world through which God is going to accomplish God's purposes. And so this is where Isaiah 53 is, is being written. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we would look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, you can't read that. You cannot help but think about Jesus when you read that. But when it was written, you know, who you're supposed to think about the Jewish people. <laughs> and so it's this theme that Matthew, okay, let's jump ahead to 85 of the Common Era. It's this theme that Matthew wants to impress upon uh, the followers of Jesus who are worshiping in the synagogue. This is how we interpret who Jesus was as a Messiah. You all were expecting at one time for a Messiah to run in here and, you know, throw out the Romans and, and all of the things that were so... Um, that are so prominent even in our culture today real power means you know power muscles you know might all of that but remember we've been living for the last five six hundred years says matthew with a new paradigm and that new paradigm says no power lies in a different type of being in the world a type of being in the world that's often seen as weakness. This is a paradoxical uh, understanding of, of, of who we are as a people and who Jesus is as a Messiah. So in te telling this passion narrative, Matthew is asking the people in the synagogue, the believers in the synagogue, to read through the lenses of Isaiah 53. <laughs> Put those on when you're hearing this passion narrative 
and see full well that not that Isaiah 53 was predicting the coming of Jesus, that that just oversimplifies it way too much, but that Jesus is living out this prototypical idea of what it means to be truly human and truly God, to be a bearer of the covenant. Uh, and so this is what is going to form that whole passion narrative in Matthew. Look, um, feel like I'm preaching here. Uh, sorry. Um, anyway, um, any any thoughts on that? I know it's hard to read Isaiah in any other way than we often are taught to read Isaiah. Or comments? I have a real quick one, Dan. Um... I'm surprised that Spong didn't emphasize this at this time because he had before, but you were talking about, you know, the time of second Isaiah and the Babylonian exile, you know, the community of Israel was in a very similar state when Matthew wrote because right. of the destruction of the temple and the Romans had taken over and their community, you know, pretty much ceased to exist as they knew it. Just Absolutely. like back in the old days. Absolutely. Almost a one-to-one -one correspondence, wouldn't you say? Temple was destroyed in 597. Temple was destroyed in 70 of the Common Era, you know. Uh, the, the, the lack of a temple led people to be completely displaced and uh, uncentered. How are we going to understand ourselves in both situations? That's what that's what we've got going on here. It's a it's a really important way to to interpret this. And I'm I'm just again I've said it many times. I'm just so grateful I've I've read this. I mean some of this I've obviously intuited and known about, but to put it together in such a systematic way, the way Spong has done is just um, he has just really been very enlightening. Um, any other comments about this? Well, let's, if not, let's go back to Psalm 22. And remember, when Jesus is crucified, the first word from this cross is the first, or first line from, he utters from the cross, is the first line of Psalm 22. But there are other ways that this psalm should be intuited, you might say, or perceived in the telling of the narrative. For example, when you get to, um, I'm going to have to get back to Psalm 22 here. We know that Jesus uh, is, there are people in the crowd who are kind of um, uh, mocking him. And let me just read this if I can find it real quick. Psalm 22, uh, verse 4. In you our ancestors trusted, uh, and they trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. This is in Psalm 22. So when, when the cr crowd mocks Jesus, they're kind of drawing on this idea, oh, you know, you trusted in your God and look, look where, you know, uh, they've gotten you. And it's further, look where it's gotten you. And it's further elaborated in uh, verses seven and eight. Um, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. That's almost word for word what we find in Matthew, right? Uh, get down off the cross. If you're really God, you know, see, see what we can, you know, see what you can do. What about that God you trust in? This is all mockery, but it all comes from Psalm 22, right? And if you're in the synagogue, you would hear this very clearly uh, if you were a, a, a Jew. And then, of course, the, the, the verses that are so clear in this are uh, verses 16 through 18. Um, For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. Uh, my hands and feet have shriveled. I can count... All my bones, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing, they cast lots, right? 
then and this is why I've left this um, this image. Well, I thought in this image, no, maybe it's the next image, but you know, the soldiers casting lots for his his clothing, uh, for his garments. Um, this this just reeks. Oh, I should I shouldn't use that word, but this just reflects so much imagery that that would have been known in Psalm twenty two, and also would have been known in uh, Isaiah fifty three. So there's so much here that. Uh, really lends itself to Spong's thesis, that this is a liturgy, this is liturgical, this narrative was meant to be a liturgy. But not only that, how was it supposed to be used? And here we're going to come back to chapter 12 that we read um, about 12 years ago, ironically. <laughs> going to come back to chapter 12. Spong begins, now we're in chapter 30, 31, um, the, on the passion narrative as liturgy, Spong talks about uh, in the you know the coming into Jerusalem and in the passion narrative itself, this these references that are made to watch. Uh, watch can be used as a as a you know like a hortatory. Uh, I think that's what they call it as a command. You know, watch you you the. Foolish virgins, virgins, or those who kept their uh, uh, their wicks trimmed and burning, watching for the coming of God. You know not when Jesus is going to come. Watch for for the coming. But there's also in Mark, especially references, and we we saw them in Matthew's crucifixion that on the the third hour this happened, the sixth hour, and so. But in ancient times, not just in the time we're talking about, usually the day was divided into three-hour segments known as watches. And Spong wants to make the point, and this is where we'll have to elaborate this next time, that this whole passion narrative that has these various scenes, right, I tried to divide them up into, and there are about 12 scenes in, in it all together, um, is written as a narrative to be read and reflected on over a 24-hour vigil that took place in the synagogue at Passover. Uh, remember, this would have been followers of Jesus, you know, uh, abiding by this new uh, liturgy in the synagogue um, and, and trying to understand the coming of the Messiah in this, in this very liturgical way, but not in a way that makes a complete break at all from Judaism. In fact, in you know has jesus firmly uh, entrenched in the in the jewish uh tradition so the passion narrative spong wants to say is a vigil liturgy it and, and is used in many of the same ways it's used uh in Ho uh, holy week except this would have been over a 24-hour period of time um and so i just conclude our discussion today with this um the sentence from uh, page 333. Well, and I've just started chapter 31. We'll talk about that in more detail next time. What we have in the passion narrative is a scripture lesson. It's designed to be read at each of the eight segments of a 24 hour vigil liturgy, allowing the followers of Jesus to watch with their Lord during the final 24 hours of his life. Uh, it's this, this vigil that was created specifically for this purpose. Historically, historically accurate, probably very little of it has a foothold in uh, historical of, of events, at, at least as they are described. Um, Sir, I'm not saying that none of it happened. I'm not. I'm just saying that there was no historian there writing down every last little um, detail to be read literally. And this gets us to the reason for Spong's title of his book, Biblical Literalism. It is an aspect of literalism to read these texts as history. History hasn't even been invented yet, so to speak. That's going to come 15, 1600 years years later, depending on how you define history. So with that being said, what, um, 
how, how do you feel about this? Any comments? Gaylene, I'm happy you're able to join us. Uh, it's been a couple of a couple of weeks, but uh, I hope hopefully we haven't left you uh, behind. <laughs> no, I'm actually only on thirty. I was in Colombia for a couple of weeks. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. So I yeah got a little bit behind. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. You know. Any other comments? Well, thank you, um, and thank you, Dwight, for your the you know lovely poem that you wrote for for Anne and and recited at the at the funeral memorial well, service. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, it was a nice service. I just love the way that literature uh, and Anne would have loved it. You know, the way that literature and poetry was was just seamlessly intertwined with it all. So. Well, everyone, um, I'm going to go back to my day job and <laughs> I'll let you go back to whatever it is that, uh, that you are occupied with today. When we come back next time and Sharon, you usually send out a message about this, but we will read chapters 31 and 32 probably. We're getting to the end of our text. So, uh, uh, you know, time to start thinking of a new one. So. Anyway, uh, anyone want the last word? If not, let me stop sharing here. All right, it's good to see you Thank all with you. big faces. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.